talking volatile organic compounds. And one thing that kind of blew me away is every time I've ever thought about, you know, greenhouse or indoor cultivation and having kind of odor control systems, it's always been about the smell. Like the neighbors don't like the smell or you don't want people to know you're growing. Right. But from a nuisance perspective or right. a security perspective. But there's mm -hmm. actually a totally different reason why you don't want the terpenes floating out of your facility and into the neighborhood. So can yes. you talk about that? Yes, happy to. Um, so terpenes are volatile organic compounds. Um, volatile organic compounds are important because they're an ingredient to ozone. Um, and ozone, it, although it's protective in the atmosphere, when it's up high, it kind of acts as an insulating blanket for our atmosphere. But down low um, in, you know, where we're, where we're breathing the air, it's actually a toxic air pollutant. It oxidizes our lungs. It actually oxidizes plants as well. Um, you actually see the plants almost like turn black and look bruised in a, in a high ozone environment. Um, so ozone is formed when volatile organic compounds are released into the atmosphere and react with nitrogen oxide emissions. Nitrogen oxide emissions are combustion emissions. Cars, power plants, anytime we're burning anything, we get nitrogen oxide as a result. So when nitrogen oxide and volatile organic compounds meet in the presence of sunlight, they form that ground level ozone, which is toxic for us to breathe. Um, in Colorado, it, it's, it's, a, it's an issue that we're looking into because all of our cannabis cultivation is in our urban environment, co-located next to all of our, our major highways, our cars, our power plants. About 60 to 70 percent of our, our marijuana cultivation is within our urban environment. And so we want to know how many pounds of VOCs are emitted per pound of marijuana grown, and then what is the ultimate influence on that ozone reaction um, because it's a public health issue. It's toxic for us to breathe, it's toxic for our environment. And so we wanna be, it's a heightened, and uh, it puts a new perspective on your odor control system, right? A heightened sensitivity, because now you're not only controlling odor for nuisance reasons or for security reasons, you're actually contributing to the public health of your community by controlling those odors because of the rea secondary reaction that can happen with ozone formation. Right. So just to be clear, if you're growing in somewhere like Humboldt or Mendocino or somewhere kind of removed, uh, you're not really creating that problem. But if you're, right. if you have so a big greenhouse next to the highway in Santa Barbara or down in LA, you have an indoor grow and you're pumping what smells to me beautiful uh, out your, you know, you're Exhaust emitting system. VOCs into, into the environment right. in a NOx-rich area. And so when you have a NOx-rich area, like in an urban environment, like downtown LA, there's a smog problem. You guys have an there ozone is. problem. There's we a do. congestion problem. There's we like have lots that of too. <laughs> um, industrial sources as well that you know provide combustion emissions. And so when you bring in this new source of volatile organic compounds, um, that traditionally wouldn't be there, you get new ozone formation. I have a question. So terpenes are obviously found in other products as well. Yes. Are they problematic there too, or is there something about cannabis that uh, is especially problematic? Sure, so um, VOCs come come in many different products. Um, anything that traditionally you know has an odor with it is, is you're smelling the volatile or co organic compound coming off of that. So you know personal care products, deodorants, um, you know perfumes, and then industrial sources would be like solvents and paints. Um, you know, but any other agricultural source, pine trees, they're all putting off um, different volatile organic compounds, but. What's unique about cannabis is that we took it from the forest and put it in the, the urban environment um, to create those reactions. And then also it just happens to be that the terpene profile associated with cannabis, those terpenes are highly reactive on the scale for um, ozone formation compared to other terpenes. So one of the things I thought so about- So like myrcene, pinene, yeah. limonene, what was the other like top? Uh, terpenaline terpenaline like those are some of the most egregious in terms of ozone precursors with yeah. and uh, what's the uh, nitrogen oxide nitrogen yes oxide. you okay. can uh short as nox nox okay yeah so does it make sense for a state to mandate um where uh, terpene rich products and agriculture are uh grown within the state for I mean, that's one factor. Um, you know, in, in Colorado, we had a lot of regulatory drivers that drove our, our industry indoor and in, you know, our urban environment, zoned industrial, 
co-located next to these sources. And so it just, it, you know, the environmental impacts of that was a little bit of an afterthought. And so we're trying to just quantify what is, you know, what is the impact? Um, it's really important to point out that there's no regulatory drivers here because cannabis is an agricultural process, at least the cultivation of it. And agricultural processes are exempt from air quality regulations. This is unique agricultural process in that no other agricultural commodity has the profit margins for it to make sense to grow it in the way that we grow cannabis. We would never grow tomatoes downtown next to Coors Field. You just wouldn't do it. We do that with cannabis. You talked a little bit in uh, your panel today about how carbon filtration can be designed specifically to, um, you know, <laughs> to correlate with phytochemical data. Um, how can phytochemical data collection be standardized at, at state and hopefully one day federal levels to improve that outcome? Um, and also I hope improve consumer outcomes as well because now they have the ingredients available to them. Yeah, so knowledge is very powerful. Um, once we know the, the terpene emission profiles specific to these cannabis facilities, we can design carbon filtration that's customized to capture those molecules because carbon filtration is a physical solution to a chemical problem. The way that carbon filtration works is there's a lots of pores within the carbon filter and it actually physically traps those molecules. So if those carbon pores are too big or too small, we're not effectively capturing those molecules. So we want to design the carbon filter specifically for the pollutants that we're trying to capture. And so in this case, those top four terpenes, they're each physically a specific size. So you'd have a carbon filtration system that had pores that were each of those sizes. So it's going to capture mostly Yeah, and it might be, you know, those four might have like, uh, they might be in a family where it's even a similar size where we're, we're targeting that specific um, molecules and very different carbon filtration for plant molecules versus, you know, industrial sources of VOCs, like maybe an ethanol or something like that. Right. Okay. So now uh, the other interesting thing we were talking about was uh, the wine industry and they're noticing kind of new terpene, like someone makes their Cabernet in Sonoma and they're noticing a new terpene yeah, in their cabinet that their wasn't there before and they're attributing it to cannabis cultivation. Yes, that, that is happening um, in the wine industry and they're interested in my VOC research from that perspective because they want to know what are the dominant terpenes coming off of cannabis cultivations and are those dominant terpenes showing up in our final wine profile and what is um, the consumer response to that? Do we embrace it as, you know, only Santa Barbara wine has these cannabis terpenes in it or, um, you know, do, do we fight against the grain there and so that's something that the wine industry is having to adapt to um, you know with this this new influx of industry being co-located next to them um, but then also from the cannabis you know farmers perspective um, they're heavily regulated on what pesticides they can use um, versus the wine industry is not so you can see from you know the transport cannabis is transporting terpenes to the wine wineries and then the wineries are transferring you know um, pesticides to the, the cannabis Soxic cultivators the other it's really interesting because the beer industry or parts of it is, are embracing terpenes and actually um, putting them into creating new products that are terpene rich and killing it yeah 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 I mean I mean there's also cannabis products too where people are adding terpenes you know concentrated terpenes in to get different flavor profiles um, you know, what is <laughs> yeah, I, I had a really uh, interesting lesson about extraction early, early on because I was naive and thought, well, why doesn't everybody do CO2 extraction so we don't get those volatile organic compounds off of solvents? Um, someone had to educate me and tell me, well, with CO2 extraction, you're not getting the terpene profile extracted. You're only getting the cannabinoids. So that'd be akin to like, you know, drinking Everclear versus a fine uh, craft beer or wine where you're getting those flavor profiles. So I had to really shift my perspective to understand the consumer needs that are driving these processes. Peanut Gallery, any other questions? Or are you guys just so overwhelmed by these deep thoughts? Well, you know, well, the one thing I thought of was that even if it's not regulated, the argument to get cultivation 
out of urban areas into um, you know rural uh, areas or or, or uh, even farther out is a, is a really strong one and might counter the NIMBY effect that is you know really problematic in California. You know, so many municipalities that you know are saying no to cannabis. Um, if they could be incentivized or, you know, they had a really powerful reason, which this is, you know, these industries will, if they're in, in, in if they're in your area, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a quality of life benefit, you know, the environment benefits in a big way. So, I mean, that's one of the things that I thought about. I don't think it could be regulated, but um, one way or another, you know, the, the, the production and the, you know, in California, the patchwork uh, system is just not working. Yeah. So, I, you know, that was one of the things. I, th I, I think the, the biggest lesson we can learn, um, you know, collectively for the cannabis industry from Colorado is the willingness to be nimble and adapt our regulatory structure to the needs of the cannabis industry. Um, you know, very early on with us being one of the first regulated markets, we, all of our regulations were focused on safety, security, no diversion to the black market. The, the environment wasn't necessarily considered in, in that regulatory structure. And so now that we're, you know, a couple of years into legalization and, and the house didn't fall down, <laughs> so to speak, yeah. uh, we can start circling back and, and finding efficiencies in our regulatory structure and working with the cannabis industry to still meet all of the needs of safety, security, no diversion to the black market, but in a more logical, sensible way. Um, I think the, the best example of that would be, you know, either the 50-50 waste rule with plant mixing having to mix with 50% non-marijuana waste, which doubles our landfill footprint, or, you know, from the packaging perspective of childproof packaging. Packaging. Yes, we want to protect our youth, um, but can we do it in a way that's not five layers of packaging? Could we manage to do it in one? Um, and then or I always maybe you don't need yeah. to package flour. Well, I, I <laughs> also not eat it. I also like to throw it out there from an environmental perspective. Now, the public health side of the house doesn't like this perspective, but from an environmental perspective, we don't uh, do childproof packaging on alcohol or tobacco. Why cannabis? Or keeping it in the family and, you know, focusing our efforts on creating hemp cellulose packaging that yeah. is far more sustainable. Yeah, we're starting to see advances in, in hemp-based plastics, um, certainly in Colorado, and they, they do have, um, they break down a lot quicker uh, than, than plastics, traditional plastics. Well, and, and I talk to brands that are kind of making these packaging decisions because it costs more. So it's kind of like, does the consumer care enough to pay a tiny bit more, you know, that's the question right now, at least. So before you go, um, is there a research being done? Am I missing your next? Uh, well, no, she I'm, I'm joking. Yeah, I'm joking. No, it's 520, so she has to go. But um, is there research being done to assess, like, what like what the impact is of these terpene VOCs? Like, how, what are they, how much they... Uh, like the amount actually is yeah i'm, I'm doing that research oh, okay. so you're <laughs> yeah doing so that. i okay. am um collecting air quality samples from commercial cannabis um cultivation facilities s getting speciation results what are the terpenes being emitted and in what concentrations and then we will be putting that into very sophisticated air quality models that already know what are the sources of of nitrogen oxide what are all the other sources of vol uh, volatile organic compounds um put that all together as the layer of cannabis emissions what's the resulting impact on ozone this is a very complicated scientific process and, and you're in the early stages of this research um well we actually we hope to publish um the results this summer so okay. so we're we're pretty far along um but any, this summer any hopefully. initial findings or like um like, the, the biggest wow. thing that i can can share at this point is just the uh the dominant terpene emission profile that we're seeing is you know um myrcene pinene limonene and terpeneline i mean those are by far the dominant terpenes that we're seeing um we're we're definitely seeing a whole family of other terpenes but at much much lower concentrations those are the dominant ones that we're seeing and i think that's really important information to know because now we know what we're controlling right we don't know the concentrations yet but we know what we're controlling at least <laughs> so at the end of this you'll have a sense of say in denver here's how much ozone is being emitted as a result of these practices correct awesome that yes. should be uh the results of that should be super interesting and should have an impact. 
Yes, um, absolutely. Um, you know, in Colorado, we're, we're uh, using it as an educational um, piece. You know, we want to know, we want to understand where our ozone is coming from and it's all the building, sources. It's building block information. Absolutely. Um, and it, it will have impacts um, nationwide and across the globe, for sure. Thank you. Yes, thank you for having me. <laughs>